There are a lot of great wrestlers out there, and due to the nature of WWE being the only major league in North America for so many years, most of those wrestlers at some point passed through the doors of their promotion. But that doesn't mean all of these performers succeeded. No, for one reason or another, some failed to make the impact they should have. But what are the greatest examples of this? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with arguably the biggest of all, and that's Sting. Yes, for decades, Sting was the only big name who, after the fall of WCW in 2001, chose not to go to work for Vince McMahon. And his reasoning for this was simple. He'd seen the way the likes of Bill Goldberg and Diamond Dallas Page had been treated when they signed on the dotted line with WWF, and he had no intention of having the same thing happen to him. So that was why he spent the majority of what remained of his career working for TNA and there becoming a five-time world champion under their banner. Of course, by the time 2014 came around, he'd finally have a change of heart, as this was the moment he decided he wanted his WrestleMania moment before he hung up his boots for good. What a shame that moment turned out to be so underwhelming then. Not through any fault of Steve Borden's, of course. No, the people to blame here were the WWE creative team, as rather than bring the icon in and have him be treated like an absolute legend, someone worthy of getting a win on the grandest stage of them all, they proceeded to have him have a great debut at that year's Survivor Series, only for this to then be ruined with the feud which followed. What was so bad about it? Well, for one, it wasn't the Sting Undertaker one everyone wanted. No, instead it was Triple H, the former WCW star was entered into a program with here. And while that could have been great too if done right, it was done more questionably as pretty quickly the whole thing turned into yet another time where Vince McMahon booked things seemingly to remind fans that he beat WCW back in the day. Unfortunately though, by this point, most fans had moved past the Monday Night Wars years prior. So that's why everyone groaned when at his lone WrestleMania about that April, Sting did the job to the game, all as JBL prattled on at the commentary booth about how WWE had won again. Thankfully though, Sting would be given a second chance to retire the right way, as his run over in AEW has been booked a lot better, with it set to reach its end point at March 23rd, 2024's Revolution in what will no doubt be an emotional night. And Sting's not the only person who's currently All Elite that failed during their WWE run, as the exact same thing happened with Lance Archer. That's right, it's a fact which had gone somewhat forgotten today, but before he was an occasional presence on AEW TV, hell, before he was even working in Japan, the Texas native was a member of the late 2000s, early 2010s WWE roster. Of course, back then he'd had a slightly different name though, Vance Archer. And the reason you may have forgotten all about this run is because it was so uneventful. Honestly, while you might have thought a man of his size and presence would be a shoe-in for success in a Vince McMahon run company, things just never worked out that way. Why was this? Well, that's hard to say. It certainly wasn't for a lack of skill on Archer's part, because he's always been someone who could go in the ring when called upon. Maybe it was just bad timing then, as let's not forget, this was a particularly dark time for WWE when the product was arguably at its worst. And that was especially true if, like Archer, you spent the majority of your run there locked away in the WWE CW brand, only making a few appearances on the bigger stage of SmackDown before being released from your contract in 2010. What could have happened then was the big man being put on Raw and getting a chance to show what he could do against the likes of John Cena. After all, it's a formula which worked for Umaga. But alas, things just wouldn't work out this way for Lance Archer, and so instead, he'd have to build a career for himself in pastures new. And that same fate would await our next subject too as it happens because, while it might have seemed obvious they'd get over in the WWE system given their lineage, when it comes to Davey Boy Smith Jr., he just never clicked in the way it was hoped he might. Now again, this isn't necessarily the fault of Davey because being the son of the late great British Bulldog, he certainly has the pedigree you would think would be enough to get him over in the WWE. And he's always been more than capable of going in the ring too, which is exactly why he's been able to excel in places such as Japan and MLW. Sadly though, when it comes to the WWE, such talents were never enough to make him a hit. Why is this? Well, he never really got a chance to fully show what he could do, as he spent most of his time there stuck in the tag team division, the kiss of death for any young up-and-comer looking to get over in WWE. After all, outside of a couple of notable periods of exception, the tag team division has always been a waste ground in WWE. So even if David Hart Smith, as he was then known, was pairing up with Tyson Kidd to have bangers against the likes of The Usos, The Nexus, and Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre, it wasn't like it was going to make his boss stand up and take notice. 
No, all it did was paint him as another expendable face in the crowd who, despite having all the talent in the world, was ripe for cutting from his contract by the time 2011 came around. And once that happened, Smith wouldn't get another opportunity to return to the company his father made himself famous in until 2020. Surely this went better then? Well, no, because that time around he wouldn't even make it to TV. Yes, after wrestling precisely one dark match, David Hart Smith would be cut from his contract all over again, making him a rare case of someone who failed in the WWE on not one, but two occasions. But even if he did fail twice, at least he didn't fail as hard as our next subject, because when it comes to Buff Bagwell, he was such a monumental flop, it actually stopped the idea of WCW becoming a whole separate brand under the WWE banner. That's right, back in 2001, after Vince McMahon had purchased the Southern Wrestling promotion, he had plans to turn it into a whole separate touring brand, something which technically existed outside the confines of his main promotion, not too dissimilar to the way Ring of Honor operates alongside AEW today. And the way he was going to get WCW 2.0 started was by having a match on the July 2nd episode of Raw that year, in which Buff Bagwell and Booker T were going to go one-on-one. -on -one all while the entire show was taken over by the old WCW presentation. Basically, it was the equivalent of a pilot episode, a way to show WWE audiences what this new show would look like once it got started. But the only problem was, it flopped hard. And a large part of the reason for that was Buff himself. Sure, you could also argue WWF fans were just too conditioned against anything else to get behind the WCW guys here, but Booker T certainly got over. No, the real issue was that, for as much as he may have had the look, and this was enough to make him a star down south for a while, in 2001 WWE, where the standard of wrestling was high for the time, the Georgia native just couldn't cut the mustard. And because of both this and the subsequent failure of the match then, Vince McMahon decided to pull the plug on the idea of his former competition becoming a separate brand, with him instead going to go down the path of an invasion angle. Could history have worked out differently if Bagwell had brought his A-game on this fateful night? Possibly. So in some ways, you could blame him for the entire debacle which followed. But don't feel too bad for him because Buff would get to keep wrestling for a while in the likes of TNA over the next few years, all before he hung up his boots for good during the late 2010s. And as it happened, that was also around about the time our next subject was failing to get over in WWE. Who are we talking about here? Why, Taya Valkyrie, of course. That's right, while she may be known today as a member of the AEW women's division, and prior to that she was a key player in both the Impact and Lucha Underground women's divisions, back in 2021 there was a brief period where La Huera Loca was signed to WWE, and it was there she would go under the name Frankie Monet, the hottest young prospect out there. Don't remember this one? We wouldn't blame you if you didn't, because it all took place on NXT during a period in which they were really struggling to pick up momentum. Yes, this was in between the heights of the black and gold era and the rise of folks such as Braun Breaker and Roxanne Perez, so many fans had tuned out of the brand altogether. And those that had ended up missing Frankie Monet's entire run then, as it only really took place over the course of a few months, with her most notable act while on the roster being to challenge then NXT Women's Champion Raquel Gonzalez for the strap on an episode of TV. Sadly though, she wouldn't win this one, and when it came time for WWE to tighten their purse strings in November of that year, she was part of a mass wave of releases, with this leading to her deciding to return to a venue she knew would use her correctly. What was this venue? Impact Wrestling, of course, the place Taya Valkyrie was able to rebuild herself to the point that she'd be able to become All Elite in 2023, and there work alongside her husband Johnny TV once more. But as we've seen before, not all women who joined the AEW roster are able to rebuild themselves after a failed WWE run. After all, this exact fate is what befell Awesome Kong. Of course, there's no reason that Awesome Kong, or to call her by her WWE name of Karma, should have ever failed to get over in WWE. Hell, she should have been everything they were looking for in a monster heel who could breathe fresh life into a division that was, at that point in time, all but non-existent. Hell, it wasn't like she hadn't already proved she could be a star in places such as Ring of Honor or TNA, as in each of these, she'd absolutely dominated the scene. Unfortunately though, once she signed with WWE in 2010, things quickly fell apart, though that wasn't to say there weren't early signs of promise here. No, at least initially it looked like Karma might actually be a big deal in New York, as she proceeded to tear through every other woman on the roster. That said, things would hit pause in May of 2021, as it was then she announced to the world that she was pregnant, with this meaning she'd be out for the next nine months in order to give birth to her first child. But such a thing didn't have to be a big deal, did it? 
After all, Becky Lynch would later take a sabbatical to have her own child and would return just as strong as ever. Well, in the case of Karma, she'd ask for more time off, something which didn't please people backstage, if rumors are to be believed. So following her appearance at the 2012 Royal Rumble, Karma would be released from the company. And because of this, Awesome Kong would only ever have one official match throughout her entire time in WWE, and that meant we never got to see her elevate the women's division there in the same way as she had done down in Nashville with the TNA knockouts. No, following her exit from WWE, she'd instead return to Impact where she'd spend the majority of what remained of her in-ring career helping to build up the likes of Madison Rain, Velvet Sky, and Allie. And of course, after she'd finished working full-time, she'd take up a player-coach role, with this allowing her to further work with the younger generation of women, just as our next subject was doing the same thing with the younger generation of men. Who are we talking about this time? Why, who else but the man who also had a failed run in WWE, Jerry Lynn. Yes, if you were an ECW fan back in the 90s, then you were all too aware of how awesome Jerry Lynn was. Hell, it was his trilogy of five-star bouts against Rob Van Dam that helped put the company on the map with tape traders at the time. And even when he wasn't taking on someone as good as RVD, he was still managing to have a series of bangers against performers such as Just Incredible, Lance Storm, and Mikey Whipwreck. So why was it that when he joined WWF in 2001 as part of the Invasion storyline, he never got his due? Well, the reason for that is probably because he was under six feet tall. Yes, it's been well documented over the years that big guys get way more opportunities than little guys within the WWE system, and this meant that even before he entered the building for the first time, the Minneapolis native was hamstrung in the Fed. Sure, he did try to overcome such perceived limitations with some good matches whenever he had the chance against opponents like Dean Malenko, Taka Michinoku, and S.A. Rios, but pretty quickly it became clear Vince McMahon didn't have a clue what to do with him and that meant there would be no opportunities for Lynn to rise above the level of B-shows, such as Velocity or Heat. No, if you were watching at the time expecting to see him pop up on Raw or SmackDown, then you were going to be sorely disappointed. And yes, he did get a brief run with the light heavyweight title at one point, but unfortunately, winning that belt back then didn't mean very much. Of course, this is a terrible shame then, because had Jerry Lynn been given a chance to shine in WWF just like RVD did, then we have no doubt he would have at the very least been able to carve out a nice mid-card spot for himself. But instead, after his exit in 2002, he'd be forced to spend the rest of his in-ring career in either TNA or Ring of Honor. And he's not the only former ECW alumnus who has failed by the WWE system as it happens, because the same could be said about our next subject too. That's right, it's time to talk about Sabu. Now, to be fair to WWE here, what were they going to do with Sabu? After all, his hardcore style may have gotten hugely over in Paul Heyman's renegade promotion during the 90s, but that kind of act was never going to fly in WWE at the time he joined the company, as they were at the beginnings of the PG era. We guess the real question then is, if you couldn't use Sabu in the way he was meant to be used, then why bring him in at all? Well, as it happens, the answer to that has everything to do with everyone's least favorite wrestling brand, WWE CW. Yes, it was in 2006 that following the success on the One Night Stand pay-per-view, WWE decided to revive the old ECW brand, which they by then owned the rights to. And in doing so, they felt like they needed to bring in some of the past legends of the promotion in order to help get it going. So that was why Sabu got the call to come in at this point, something we're sure he did with Glee as it meant getting a nice opportunity at a stage in his career. The only problem with him being part of this new ECW revival, however, was that there was very little of the original ECW about it. Rather, it was just a glorified WWE developmental brand with an extreme paint job over the top of it. That's right, it didn't matter what the former FTW champion did then, he always was destined to fail as there was nothing going on around him which allowed him to play to his strengths. Seriously, whether he was taking on Rey Mysterio, Stevie Richards, or in one absolute fever dream moment, John Cena, it made no difference as all of the magic of his character was drained away. And because of that, he'd be gone too by 2007, with him at this point returning to the indies for the next few years until TNA came calling. But what of another one of his former ECW cohorts? Surely they would do better in WWF, especially as they came in with a whole bunch of fanfare following a successful WCW run. Well, while you may think that this would have been the case for Dean Malenko, sadly, it wasn't. No, of the four radicals who joined the Fed in early 2000, you would have thought that at least three of them had big things in their future, as they were three of the best wrestlers in the world back then, and yes, no offense to Perry Saturn, but we're talking about Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and Dean Malenko here. 
Unfortunately, though, while both Benoit and Guerrero would reach great heights during their run, with both becoming world champions before all was said and done, the same could not be said for the man of 1,000 holds. And while this is easy to blame on his size, it's not as if the rabid Wolverine and Latino Heat were big guys either, so what held him back then? Honestly, we're not sure. Maybe it was a lack of character? After all, while Dean Malenko was a technical maestro approaching the level of a Brian Danielson or a Bret Hart, he never was the most charismatic guy in the room, at least not on screen. But then you could say the same exact thing about Chris Benoit too and he still became a world champ in WWE. The only other thing we can think of then is that he simply became lost in the shuffle on the 2001 WWF roster as there were only so many spots available for so many of the amazing talents around at the time. Of course, this is a shame because Dean Malenko could have been so much more if he'd been given the opportunity. Hell, just imagine how much he would have excelled if he'd been around today in a company that now has more of a focus on the in-ring product than ever. What kind of a banger could he have had against an opponent like Chad Gable, Seth Rollins, or our Lord and Savior, Gunther? And if he'd been sent down to work in NXT with the younger generation for a while, then we can only imagine the beautiful violence he would have created with a Charlie Dempsey, Carmelo Hayes, or Ilya Dragunov. Really, is it too much to ask for a time machine so we can go back and right some of these wrongs? And while we're on the subject, we really would also like to right the wrong that was our next subject's time in WWF, none other than Terry Gordy. That's right, Terry Gordy, the father of Ruthless Aggression Era Smackdown jobber Slam Master J. However, his real claim to fame is that he was one third of the fabulous Freebirds alongside Doc Hendricks and one of the original Hollywood Blondes the trio that were prominently featured as the archenemies of the Von Eriks and the Iron Claw. So you'd think that given he was a man with so much success under his belt then, he'd be treated like wrestling royalty once he joined WWF in 1996. But that's where you'd be wrong, because by this point in his career, years of brawling had caught up to the former Freebird, meaning he was no longer the performer he once had been. And this led to WWF not having enough confidence in him to use him in any other role than that of the Executioner. Who was the Executioner? Well, in short, he was a hooded druid who aligned himself with Paul Bearer and Mankind during their initial feud with The Undertaker, and that meant he'd be one of the people tasked by the heel duo with taking down the dead man. So it was then that at In Your House 12, it's time on December 15th of that year, in what may very well have been the worst Texas death match of all time, Gordy stumbled around for 11 minutes before being put down by his opponent for a 10 count. Understandably then, less than a month later, the Executioner would be gone and Terry Gordy would be forced to return to the indie circuit where he ran out the remainder of his career. Was it a shame he never got a better run in the Fed? Sure, but as we've seen today, not everyone can succeed there, even if they are great in their own right.